You're listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Today on the show, I'm excited to welcome Josh Broom from the Broom Closet is the podcast that Josh Broom hosts where he shares his life story about going from... Yeah, he was he was involved in the pornography industry. Yes. And um, there is a lot of talk about pornography and sex and stuff in this episode. So if you're listening with your kids and you don't want to have an awkward conversation, it's not an appropriate talk. It's just where he was at. Yeah. But at the same time, um, man, if you're in denial about some stuff, you should probably skip this episode. Dude, I've always been so inspired by him. Um, so many people have struggled with pornography, but to know someone who's been not only in it, but like, you know, famous in it and then just walk away from it and share his story. Why? Very inspiring. And he's going to go. So I just see him going to a place of changing a lot of people's lives and inspiring a lot of people's lives. Let's get into this episode with Josh Broom. Josh Broom. Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks, thanks for having me. Guys. Yeah, we're really excited. You you have your own podcast. I do, I do. From the broom closet. From the broom closet. So, mm-hmm. so clever. A little cross pod promotion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where can people find your hashtag? <laughs> where can people find your podcast? Uh, from the uh, from the broom closet dot com. It's on uh, Libsyn, uh, iTunes, iHeartRadio, all the places all the podcast the exists. Yeah, yeah. That's the very clouds, cool. all, all the clouds. The we were grabbing some coffee upstairs and you're saying you just recently had your wife on. Yeah. 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 And, of, and of course she's like, I don't want to do it. I'm not good at this. And then it has like 5 million times more views. Than yeah. Any, she's like, else. give me the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I got this. You step I, over there. I got something I've been wanting to say. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, start with that one. Who need to check out Josh's podcast? <laughs> yeah. 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 The room closet. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, man. So, I know a little bit about your story because I know you in real life. We go and, way uh, back. We go way back. <laughs> but, uh, I just wanted to synopsis a little bit so we could jump right in because I think your story is amazing. Yep. You um, it started. You moved to California. You got involved in uh, pornography. You Correct. became successful in that field. Um, then you left that industry. Now you're happily married. You got a new son. Uh, you're running a CrossFit gym, and you're you're kind of gearing up for the next chapter of your life. Yeah, and. Um, I know that's a quick synopsis there, yeah. and I didn't mean to <laughs> just <make> fly <laughs> on past the last <laughs> 10 years. And that's a wrap. We're done yeah. with this episode. Yeah, I hope you yeah. enjoyed everybody, and you really learned Thanks a for lot. having me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think the obvious question, I want to, uh, I don't know if it's obvious, but it's where I want to start. So tell me about how you got involved in pornography. Yeah. So I was living in Los Angeles. I was modeling and acting and struggling to do so. Um, I didn't budget for myself or anything like that. So I would work and I'd make a, you know, a decent amount of money and then I'd squander it. But I started waiting tables. I was at a pretty popular place. It was Saddle Ranch, which is on Sunset Boulevard in the middle of Hollywood. Um, waiting tables there and just met a group of women and they were like, Hey, are you an actor? I was like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They were like, well, well, have you ever thought about like adult films? I'm like, well, I mean, I got a little scruff, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown up. I'm, I'm an adult. I am, I am an adult, you know? Um, but then I know we're talking about pornography. If you, if we introduce you to our agent, then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll do really well. You should check this out. And, you know, it, it was a bunch of, attractive women so I was like yeah you know I'll I'll check it out and I met with their agent and he was like yeah there's not a lot of good looking guys in this business if you can perform if you can do this well then you can make as much money and have as much fame as you want and you'll be special and he patted me on the back and told me all the right things I wanted to hear Mm -hmm. because I was in a place in my life where I was trying to figure out who I was. I was longing for affirmation from any and everyone I could get it. And, uh, yeah, what was going on like in your personal life at that time? What, what had you, you grew up here, right? Yeah. Well, uh, South Carolina. So I grew up like right outside of Charlotte. So like on the state line, I was born in Charlotte, just grew up without a dad and it wasn't a bad situation by any means. Just he lived in the same town as me. We didn't have a relationship. They were, you know, 16. So I can, 
like being a dad now, I can be like, I can't even wrap my head around being 16 years old yeah. and being a dad. You know, I'm 36 and I have no idea what I'm doing. <sighs> he was in the same town. He got married to someone else, had two kids and those kids had, you know, a, what I perceived to be a better life than me. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I guess it was some jealousy, but some longing where that's, you know, that's my father and we're not in a relationship where he doesn't have anything to do with me. So kind of made me feel what's yeah. wrong with me. You know, what, what can I do to to fill this gap? There's a void within me that I need to fill with something. So I spent 20 years trying to fill that gap with various things. Yeah. Hmm. So your dad grew up in the same town. I didn't, I didn't realize that that had to have been really tough to do. Oh, like literally there's one grocery store. Food line. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Food line. And uh, I think, <laughs> I think they have a buy load now. Oh yeah. They're growing. Yeah. 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 Ta- maybe a Taco Bell next year. It's a long-term plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, an incredibly small town. Like I graduated with a hundred people, like incredibly small town, impossible not to see him on a uh, monthly, if not weekly basis somewhere in, in passing. Yeah. Do you think that's why you left? I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely was like on a pursuit for something, but yeah. ultimately like, when I left to go to college, I kind of left, I just left, you know, like the, the relationship with my family was never the same. Like not, not necessarily in a bad way, but it was just very different. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to pursue this version of myself, how, whomever how, it may be. How small was your hometown? I have to like look at the numbers. But I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking like 5,000, 5,000, 10,000 people tops. I grew up in a small town, so did Josh. I yeah. wonder like, because it's very comfortable living in a small town. You know everybody. Oh, yeah. um, but then there's, when people leave, uh-huh. uh, there there can sometimes be a stigma like, oh, too good for us, huh? You're leaving. Right. Or there's not a stigma and you leave and you're like, Oh look, there's a whole nother world out here. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. T- time to do some exploring. Yeah, I think it, <laughs> yeah. there is like, if you're from, if you're from a small town, especially from the South, yeah. there's almost this, you know, my family does this. So this is what I'm going to do. Like a very like traditionalist type mindset, or mm-hmm. it's like, I got to get out of here. So yeah. the, ob- the objective is to, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't even matter what you're doing. Your, your objective is to leave. Yeah. yeah. LA is a tempting place for all those people right, right. around the world. Yeah. It's like, let's yeah. go to Hollywood. Yeah. Right. What was your plan when you were going to Hollywood? Honestly, I didn't have much of one. I was like, better place to live. Yeah. It's yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Beach, <laughs> yeah. beach and so yeah. But I mean, ultimately like I'd had, uh, a lot of success modeling, just being a knucklehead kid, like not showing up to auditions half the time. If I got jobs, it was because people booked me without me like showing up. So I, I was like, if I can skate by not trying, if I like actually apply myself and go out there, I'll just crush it. You yeah. Know? And I did not yeah. crush it. I got crushed. <laughs> did you have any experience with pornography before you went out? I mean, like as a, as a viewer, uh, I mean, I, we had dial up. I, th- I think that <laughs> <laughs> I probably, <laughs> probably attempted to, well, how old attempted are you? To, uh, 36. Okay. So I'm 41. So back in the day, it was like, you called, you could call numbers and talk to women. Right. And right, you know, I remember right. that. Yeah. That was earlier. So yeah, I was pretty much the same age I think as Josh. That I, may, I think I may have done that before also, but yeah. what are you wearing? Yeah. It's just all downhill yeah. from there. Right? Yeah. It's like, what do you wear? I yeah. remember. Uh, and the phone bill comes <laughs> in and your mom's like, what's this $25? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember. Uh, so you mentioned dial up. I remember there was a buddy that lived on the other side of town was like the first guy to get dial up. And it's, it's comical, but I think it was a part of growing up. If you were our age where you're waiting for the image to download right. and it's going like <laughs> line by line yeah. and you're like, Oh, Oh, a little yeah. bit more, a little bit more, a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. I remember being at home and like, I would get home from school at like, I don't know, like two 30 or something like that. My mom would go home at four and I'd be like, okay, it's going to take like 30 minutes for this thing to down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I watched some of it, but yeah, I was exposed to it, but I, I don't yeah. think that that was ever a dream to go do that. No. Yeah. What, what did you learn about the industry while you were there? Like what was surprising about it? I mean, Wait, get, to be specific, the pornography the industry pornography or the industry. entertainment? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know what I thought it was going to be, but you know, I, I show up and there's, you know, there's paperwork and there's assistance and there's, you know, there's lighting and there's booms and there's like, I mean, it's like, it's a full on production. And I, 
for some reason, I just thought I'd be like, maybe it was just me holding the camera. Like there's like a mm-hmm. camera up in the corner. I never thought about there being a director, a camera one and two, a, a boom guy, yeah. you know, a, a, you know, someone doing sound, Kino flows everywhere. And I was like, man, this is. Mm-hmm. Well, you were in the A leagues. Yeah. You yeah. Went right to the A league. Yeah. I, I did have, if, if there's a good place to be, that, that is where I was. Um, there, there were, you know, like, some people like run and gun, like shooting stuff that, especially in Miami, they do a lot of that stuff where I'll just have a camera and two people and they're like, all right, we're going to go this area where we probably shouldn't be filming. We mm-hmm. definitely don't have any permits or anything like mm-hmm. that, but we're just going to go, you know, knock this out and we're going to film it. And did I, you go, to, did you fly across the country and work in Miami and go back to LA? You were like flying oh, around yeah, so for I, this? Yeah. I, 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 I worked in Miami, Costa Rica, the Dominican, London, mm. Germany. I mean, pretty much any like big place. Vegas shots mm-hmm. a lot. So they passed some kind of law um, in Los Angeles or, or in California where 100% of the pornography has to be used. You have to use condoms. Mm-hmm. So now pretty much pretty much all the porn industry has moved to Las Vegas because you, mm. there's no parameters for that there. Wow. And you became pretty successful in the industry, right? Pretty much out, out of the gate because I could, I had some acting ability and I was a, a face that they could slap on a, on a box. I started mm-hmm. working a lot. So I went from working, I was doing like 10 movies a month. And then I was like, you know, talking to my agent and they're like, okay, well, let's up your, you know, your, your day rate. Cause you get, you get a day rate. You know, so you don't get like residuals or anything like that. So whatever you make that day is, is, you know, no, so that's it? a lot different than other people who get residuals, but right. that's not the case in the pornography. Industry. Right. If you, if you don't really care about the you know, the repercussions of, of what you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. you know psychologically, you know, mm-hmm. did that but, ever bother you that side of it or was it? Yeah. Was there a struggle? Like, well, did you like, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're human beings. You're right. having emotions for other people and you're doing this job. It's like, yeah, it, it was really wild because, Again, like kind of what it would look like, like I would go on the set and like the very, the very first time it's like, okay, uh, here's this, uh, Viagra. You should take this because it's your first time. Uh, mm-hmm. you should cut it in half. It's going to be too much for you to take, you know, like, cause you've never taken it before. Mm-hmm. So like go in the bathroom, I'm like, I better take the whole thing. <laughs> so I, I, I took the whole thing oh, and dang. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I'm just like standing there and it's like, okay, so we're going to be probably shooting about an hour. So I was like, Oh, great. You know, so I'm just sitting there like ready to go. <laughs> you know, I never had a conversation with the girl, the, the normal interaction you would have with a person never happened because, okay. The director would say, okay, you're going to do this and that. And the first thing the girl would do, you would, she would take, uh, photos just like normal photos and then she would you know strip or whatever and then like all right this is what this is what the the scene is here's your character sometimes they were a script and it was more elaborate sometimes it was just like okay here's the scenario just wing it welcome the room and when like when you're about to start that would be the first time that you meet the person and you don't even know the real name and they don't know your real name and all you've seen is you know, you, I've seen her documentation, her test, and I signed off that I saw her test and she, you know, signed off on mine. But other than that, we've had no conversation. Are a lot of people dealing with STDs and you're seeing it and you're like, okay, I've got that or don't have that or I'm, I'm willing to risk that. I'm oh, no. So you, you have to have a, a, a new test every 21 days. Yeah. So and it's like if, if you don't have a clean test, you can't, can't work. So people are actually like 100 percent clean in the industry. They can maintain that somehow. Well, it's like if you, if you don't have a clean test, you can't work. Wow. Yeah, so I mean that's like this. That's just one thing. It was like non-negotiable. It's like yeah. it, the the testing. I mean, if there was a if there was a saving grace, mm-hmm. you know, it's like mm-hmm. you know, I did a thousand movies and it, you know, I didn't experience STDs. It's like you know, the testing process is pretty elaborate and works. Wow, um, that's impressive. You mentioned earlier that um, you know, going and seeking approval, seeking affirmation. Right. Um, did did that come from being successful in the I pornography think was, industry? I think it was like one of those things that's like instantaneous where like you're in the moment. So it feels good. And I was in such a fog that like, I, I really wasn't like myself. I think I would get further removed from who I actually was and closer to who I thought I wanted to be. Mm. And, 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 but the, the, the picture of, this person that I thought I wanted to be kept getting more and more distorted 
but Josh was almost like out of the picture. Like I, I, I didn't even exist because I was this guy with his stage name. You know, if, if I show up, you're going to call me my stage name. If I'm in the movie, you're going to call me my stage name. You know, is it, mm-hmm. and, and if I got a phone call from an agent, you're calling me my stage name. If I was, you know, in a circle of people that I work with, you're calling me my stage name. So all of a sudden, like Josh didn't even exist. Mm. Uh, 1,000 movies. You said 1,000 movies. Yeah. What did it feel like towards the beginning of realizing? Because I know you get, you got out. That's right. kind of. Yeah. And we were talking last time we had coffee about. And I want to touch on that again, just what it's like for people to leave that industry. Yeah, uh, it's incredibly sad because it almost like it's like human trafficking at, at some point where you justify doing something you know you shouldn't do. Uh, you start to develop emotions negatively about it. You're like, OK, I know that this is wrong, but I'm continuing to do it anyway because I believe that I am scarred in a way where this is all I can do. And and then, you know, the agents and directors really, really prey on that where it's like, come on, what else are you going to do? If, if someone, I, I heard many, many times on set where I'm thinking about doing this, why would you do that? Come on. You know, like, it's not like you're going to, you know, get married to someone like your, or you're, you know, how can you be successful in this other avenue of business? Because, you know, there's all there's all this stuff on you on the internet that's mm-hmm. not going to go away. So why would you do that? Just get, you're making good money. You know, why yeah. wouldn't you just continue doing that? So it's incredibly sad. It's incredibly sad. And then you have these sad people doing doing something they they necessarily don't want to do, and they're doing it because they feel like they have to, or they're doing it because they feel like there's nothing else they can do. Yeah. So then you're experiencing that emotion on a daily basis. So you're doing something you don't want to do. And it's not just like, I'm not going to punch a clock at a job that I don't want to do. You're going to have sex with someone, you know, that, and that's an incredibly intimate thing. And, and, and the, the design of sexuality, it's not, it's not built to be made, you know, it's not built to, to function that way. Right. Yeah. Did you, do you feel like you maybe like towards the end when it was about the time you were thinking about leaving? Right. Um, were you dealing with thoughts like that? Like, what else can I do? This is. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was to the point where I was like, God, if you exist, just let me die. I, that's, that's where I was. Yeah. And it, it's just, it still baffles me. It's like, I would love to go back and like be back in my head because I got to the point where I justified if I do gay porn, that's going to stop me from being able to do straight porn. And it's going to be a way for me to not work as much or maybe get out. Mm. Like that was a a justifiable thought that my sexuality didn't even exist. The picture that porn paints is just not real. It's there. There's not two people who are attracted to each other that are, that are doing that. And it just happens to be captured on camera. It's two broken people in an awkward position doing something they probably don't really want to be doing and they feel like they have to the guys who do stuff challenge do this stuff all right we interrupt this episode with josh broom to talk about accountability yeah here's the thing that i've learned about accountability josh what have you learned if that person doesn't ask you to hold them accountable you're just annoying somebody i don't get it Unpack it. So if you've ever tried to hold somebody accountable that didn't ask you to hold them accountable, you're just being really nagging. Oh. And so I think one of the things that's really important for accountability is on the person like yourself to put the onus on yourself to allow people to hold you accountable for an area you know that you need accountability. In. Oh, yes. There has to be a will there, right? Yes. Like, yep. I remember it wasn't, I don't know, maybe last week or whatever, I was talking about how I'm trying to overcome some uh, workaholic type tendencies in my life. And I was talking to you about it. And I said, you know, just feel free to check in with me about this. And you said something along the lines of, oh, thank you for giving me permission. I will check in. Oh, did I say that? Was that my natural yeah. reaction? Yeah. Oh, how poignant. <laughs> yes, how poignant. So I think if there's an area of your life, I think this is the, this is the, this is the moment here. This if there's an it. area of your life where you know that you could use some accountability. Yeah. Your first step is you've got to ask for it. Somebody you trust, 
somebody that uh, is a friend of yours, maybe yeah. it's your spouse. Yeah. Say, hey, this is where I'm struggling in this area. I could, I would appreciate it if you would hold me accountable on this. Yeah. And then you gotta, you gotta give them that permission and mean it. And I think that's a good first step. Yeah. It what is. Josh was talking about Josh Broom during today's podcast with um, about the idea of pornography addiction in um, in people that struggle with that. There's a couple of good pieces of software that I've I've used in the past. Um, there's one called X3 Watcher and one called Covenant Eyes. Right? Yes, and the gist of both of them is that they allow you to sign up for and put some stuff on all your browsers and internet devices that will send a list of the websites that you visited that could be viewed as inappropriate to this person that is going to hold you accountable. It's something that you really want to get serious about changing. Change seems to happen best in community, in people's lives, um, instead of in secret. Strange things grow in a vacuum. That's true. Like dust mites and... Mold. <laughs> various things that grow inside. No, not in a literal vacuum. I get what you're saying. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, again, let's get back into this with Josh Broom. This is, you know, almost seven years of, of doing pornography, like from... The time I was there and it got to a point where I was embarrassed that I was doing it. My friends and family had found out that I was doing it. So it was almost, oh no, not almost. It was, it was on me that I started stepping myself away from my family and friends. In some cases, my friends, you know, unfriended me on, you know, different, you know, social media and whatnot, but and stopped returning my tax, but my family continued reaching out to me, but I was almost embarrassed to go home. So I stopped going home and I, I stopped answering their calls. So I, I pulled myself, I had excluded myself into a, a, a level of isolation where like when I say I didn't hear my name on a regular basis, I didn't like at all. Yeah. So one day I was in the bank cashing a check and, um, the, the teller just looked at me and said, Joshua, is there anything else I can help you with? And I don't know why, but it just crushed me. It crushed me. And, and like looking back on it, I feel like it was God speaking to me. But like in that moment, it's like I just woke up from not even a dream. It's like, I, I felt like I was dead. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, what, what, what have I done? My first instinct was to go home. Um, so I decided in that moment that I was going to quit. Just, just hearing, just hearing my name and just snapping out of it. I was like, I got to get out of here. So I went home and it's like, all right, I'm going to call my agent. I'm like, I can't be, can't be on set tomorrow. He's like, well, are you, are you sick or whatever? And I was like, no, I'm not coming back. He's like, oh, well, maybe like a few days or, and I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And that cost me a lot of money. <laughs> you know, I, cause I had to, I was in a contract, so I had to buy my way out of that contract and mm. I ended up leasing my apartment, um, to someone. But like, I was like, if, if you just want to like take everything in my apartment, just write me a check. I was like, well, when do you want to move out? I'm like today. So now you made it back home. What yeah. was coming home like? Yeah. 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 That coming home was that, that was the, probably the worst year of my life mm -hmm. because, uh, I think that anytime you spend a long time in a fog and then you come out of it, sometimes there's, there's good things, but also you have to look back on where you were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was the toughest thing for me because when I was doing porn, I didn't have a lot of regret while I was doing it. Like towards the end, I started feeling like a lot of depression and um, like I, I felt dirty and things like that. But all of a sudden being completely removed from that. Now I'm not spending the time talking to the same people I'm talking to. I'm not making the same money I was making. I'm not in the same luxury of living. All of a sudden I'm removed from all those things and I'm left with, the memories of all the things that I'd done. Um, I was, I was coaching CrossFit and uh, I was working at uh, Whole Foods and I thought, okay, I moved to Raleigh. I'm going to have a new life. I'm going to 
do something else. And I felt good about myself sometimes because I was not doing that thing anymore, Mm -hmm. but I by no means dealt with it. And that, that was the, that was probably the worst thing I could have done because now I I just tried to suppress these emotions and sweep one in the rug. And I would just, you know, I, I lived in Los Angeles for a long time. What'd you do there? Well, Hmm. Yeah, things. I was the king of the pornography industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I, doing that. I did a little bit of acting and modeling. You know, work. I did, worked in bars, and then, I, but like the ad, the acting and modeling thing bit me in the butt a few times because I said, "Oh, I did a little bit of acting and modeling," which was true. But uh, if you if you Google my name, you you you'll find a lot more than you bargained for, probably. You know. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that when you were describing the porn industry is almost um, like sex trafficking or right. almost predatory. Like right. you, if you were trying to leave your, there were approaches that people would take that right. seem like really gross. Cool. Right. Like, yeah. 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 Well, so I imagine leaving didn't leave people in the industry happy with you. Oh no. There's, there's a, there's a blog post is still up that said the reason I left is because I, I contracted HIV and, mm. and then that was shared. That's been shared like over like 5 million times. Wow. Well, I have to imagine that there's a lot on the line for an industry Right. to reveal things like cuz what you're saying sounds a lot like what a whistleblower at a at a at another organization or or industry right. that is doing very poor practices that the right. public would disapprove of right um so i have to imagine that there was some of that that probably got really oh yeah ugly yeah well i mean on a on a daily basis i like is it from someone who is in the business that's trying to continue to sabotage my life i don't know but on a daily basis best case scenario weekly basis i get some type of message from someone or my wife does or my or someone in my family does or my friend does or someone you know emails a list on my gym someone you know i i own a crossfit gym um someone will try to sabotage me in in some way and try to slander my name Mm. But, um, people crazy, yeah. people just damn crazy. Yeah. How long ago was this now? Like, when did you leave LA? Has it, has it proved difficult for you? Um, whether it's getting a new job or forming new relationships, that moment where you're, where either somebody's going to tell them or oh, yeah. like, you know, he did porn. Right? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, when I, I was, I was dating and I, I wasn't dating seriously, so it wasn't a big deal. But then I met this girl and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this girl's incredible. She's amazing. She's perfect. Crap. I have to, I have wow. to tell her, you know, but I was, but I was used to rejection. I was expecting rejection because <laughs> like you were just saying, there were several jobs that I had or opportunities that I had, you know, cause I tried to get back into modeling and acting and I would maybe even book something and a few days would go by. They were like, you know what? We kind of figured out. You know, you you'd done some stuff in your past, and we don't really want to. What's crazy about attack, that is attack, the attack. world like holds that up on such a high pedestal, and then when it comes to inv- engaging you, it's right. just like, no, we don't want anything to do with you. Meanwhile, they're going home and masturbating to right. pornography. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. Sorry to be so blunt, but but it's true. It's like a hypocritical thing, right? Right. I tell this girl that. You know, okay, so we went, you know, we, we, we've headed off. I want but I need to tell you about my, my past. And I was like, so I did a thing. I did a few pornography movies. She's like, what? Wait, where were, where were you when this went down? Uh, uh, so we talked about this, but, um, the, 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 the initial conversation that kind of cops out of it and the, the very initial conversation, like that, the, not the deep seated conversation, but the, deep, the, the first initial conversation was like kind of via, uh, via text, I think. So I was just like decided, like, I was like, I was like, I'm not going to tell her this. I'm like, I have to tell her this. I'm not going to tell her. Yeah. So you put it in text so it couldn't be undone. Like yeah. this happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, send. <laughs> I was like, I, I did it. I did some porn. You know, like what? <laughs> wow. But I mean, like you've met my wife. Mm-hmm. It's like, she, like, she, I, I would not, I, I don't think like if she, if she sees like something like on like a soap opera, she's like, not appalled, but it's like, oh, that's weird. 
You know, like she, she's, she's as green as it gets. Like she, she's cut from a different cloth. Mm-hmm. But you know, like when I, I, I really believe like when I said porn, like she was just like, didn't really like know what I was talking about. You know, she's like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I, I've done like a thousand movies. Oh, and then God. she was like, Whoa. Holy crap. But after letting that process, her, her reaction blew me away because her reaction was, do you know who God is? Wow. And that was a big thing for me because it wasn't, do you know that God exists? You shouldn't be doing that. That's not what she asked me. She said, do you know who God is in a sense where do I have a relationship with God? Do mm-hmm. I understand? Do, do I understand how God feels about me? Do I understand how God views me? I, I don't think I really like understood how beautiful that was in that moment but it was something I definitely grasped onto but like looking back on it like if, if she would have said anything other than that to me I probably would have like retracted back but I didn't because it was do you know who God is and I was like I believe God exists I, I always I, I acknowledge that God existed I think that Wait, so this whole time in LA, the seven years, right? Which is an interesting number of years. Yeah. You weren't going to church or there wasn't somebody oh. ministering to you and you were like receptive to some sort of scriptures. It's just. Oh, absolutely not. Wow. I bet you had people, because th- wasn't that the time that like Craig Gross and those guys were doing X3 church and stuff out there? Yeah. But I mean, that, that, like it was almost like white noise. Yeah. You know, it's like, you shouldn't do that. You're like, really? Yeah, of course I shouldn't be doing this. You know? Yeah. So like. <laughs> like that was the thing that you're like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wasn't aware. <laughs> like you're right. You didn't say that. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> I had no idea I shouldn't be doing this, you know, but I mean, but that's how I felt. It's like, you know, you shouldn't do this. I'm dirty. And, and, and that's, so, so that was the, the, you know, in, in a cookie cutter message, like that's what I would hear all the time. So I, did I understand God existed? Yes. Did I have a relationship with him? No. She said that to me. And then, it, it, it was just like a, it's been like a whirlwind. Like she says that to me. I start to kind of like think, I'm like, wow, like, do I know him? Like I know of him. I guess I don't know him. I guess I don't know him. And then we start going to church. Then I just have this moment in church where I'm I'm hearing things that I've never heard before. I'm hearing the same thing I've heard before, but I hear God speaking to me and his own voice in my heart. And they just, they just, it wrecked me. Yeah. It wrecked me to know that there's a God big enough to look at my sin and say, you know, I, I'm a lot bigger than that, you yeah. know, and, and see me as his son and me longing for the father that I always long for and me trying to fill a void that I couldn't feel. Was that the moment where like the affirmation and the approval and the validation? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just washed over me and I, I stopped looking at myself like I wasn't good enough. What I understood the most was it's not try, it's trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Like it's not try, it's trust. Even, even before I would think, okay, so if I want to be in a relationship with God that I need to try to not do the things that I'm doing, I need to try to be better. I need to, and, I, and what, I, what I understood was I needed to trust that he was better. Yeah. And how he sees me is based on who he says I am. It was just, it was everything. It was yeah. it. Yeah. And so now kind of fast forwarding. So you, how long were you back in the area before you met your wife? Two years, two years. So it's been like five years. You guys now have your son. He's under one. How old is he? He's eight months. He's eight months old. And, uh, last time we got coffee, he was a little sick, but he was, yeah. still, he's cute though. Even though he was yeah. sick, he was just like, I'm sick. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. So you left LA and you said you moved to Raleigh, but you're from more from the Charlotte area. So right. a lot of our listeners are here in the Raleigh triangle area. Why, why Raleigh? Yeah. So I started coaching CrossFit and why well, I, I personally trained a little bit before I was kind of just 
trying to, you know, figure out who I was and what I could do. And I, I love working out and I played basketball a little bit in college. And uh, I, I just love like athletics. Mm-hmm. I love training. I love working out. So I started personal training a little bit and found CrossFit and I was doing CrossFit and I started coaching CrossFit. And uh, I was like, well, I haven't I haven't done anything other than like coach CrossFit for this small amount of time and do pornography. What can I put on a resume? Definitely not pornography. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're going with uh, CrossFit. So I literally applied to every CrossFit, like literally from Charlotte to Raleigh. And that's how I ended up in Raleigh. Nice. I, I, my credentials weren't that great in my experience. Wasn't that great. But seeing that like, so CrossFit blossomed and bloomed and started in Los Angeles or in like that, you know, the, in that area. So there was just something appealing, something. Yeah. Was this right when it was just coming onto the scene? I'm not very familiar, but so about five years ago, it was right about the time that everybody was like CrossFit. Yeah. So it was definitely in the ether. Oh yeah. So 2009 was the very first crop. This is crazy. So talking about exponential growth. So 2009, if you want to do the CrossFit games, uh, you just showed up at this ranch and they put together some workouts and you won like $500. Uh, today, there's 450,000 people who participate in this qualification progress. Yeah. Uh, That's process. nuts. And then 40, there's 40 men, 40, 40 women, uh, one winner, and that winner gets $275,000. Yeah. And, and it's on ESPN. I don't know yeah. much about CrossFit, but I have been at, a, at an establishment that is a bar and grill before when it's been on TV. And those guys are nuts. And women. Uh, they are crushing these and they seemingly are competing against themselves, but yet yeah. they're competing against other people. And, um, so I, like I said, I know very little about CrossFit. So you guys are CrossFitters. Yeah. So Josh and I we decided are. if we're going to have Josh Broom on the podcast, we gotta go we're going to go to his 5, 15 AM yeah. yep. session we did and go it. do yeah. CrossFit with him. And I just got to tell you, uh, one, it was fun. And there's a couple of things I noticed. Uh, the people were really nice, which I think is one of the reasons why it's probably such a successful right. program is that because you got accountability and people who work out with you and like they would notice if you weren't there right. and you definitely had that kind of people. And I yeah. bet the early crew were the super committed yeah. and they were really nice to Josh and I and we were, yeah, were. We were doing our best you know trying <laughs> to figure out what was going on or whatnot yeah. and um but secondly I was crazy sore for like yeah. five or six <laughs> days in areas like I never my butt has never been sore <laughs> but like I just remember for three or four days being aware that my butt was there yeah. in a way that I'm just not used to you have muscles there we went, on, we went on leg day which I do yeah. my best to try and skip whenever yeah. there's a workout <laughs> regimen and you yeah. can tell by the size of my legs but uh so we were doing squats and all the and all the stuff yeah. and uh it was like i was like the old man from up getting around the house just like <laughs> shuffling around for three or four days and josh and i are currently training for a marathon so like i thought this would be like any other soreness right now yeah. just run it away so i went and did like 40 minutes yeah uh, running and uh, I was crazy sore for the first 35 minutes. And then it started to feel better for like the last 10. And I'm yeah. like, yes, it yeah. started to feel better. And then as soon as I stopped, it was back. Is that yeah. a good idea? What he did so, running through the pain? Sure. Through the, yeah. Through the sore? That, that's what I always tell. I, I tell people, uh, motion is lotion. Yeah. Because well, I mean, if, if I you, was so sore that it took yeah. 30 minutes of lotion. <laughs> yeah. Get, yeah. Because, <laughs> because also if you're, if you're super that's sore that. and you just like sit on the couch and not do anything, oh, like yeah, the soreness not is help. not going to go away. Yeah. You know, the, the, your soreness is those, you've broken down muscle fibers right. and they need it's to good heal. Stuff. It's good news when right. you're sore from yeah. working out. Right. Right. Yeah. And then, but generally like putting your body through a natural range of motion and getting blood flow, like that's the way that actually recover your muscles. Yeah. Oh, okay. Blood yeah. Blood. Were you yeah. sore? I, I texted was sore. you a I couple loved days it. later. I love yeah. it. Sore in a great way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You went on a trip the next. Uh, yeah, I was on an airplane, yeah. like in airports, and I just felt like much better having soreness while I'm traveling. Yeah, yeah. the moving yeah. walk. You didn't have. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to I was travel. walking back and forth up the terminal. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was definitely conscious of the blood flow. Yeah. So you've been running that CrossFit gym now for close to five years, then. Uh, that one. So I've owned a CrossFit for a little over two years. It was just, yeah. it's just wild the the journey that I've been on because. Anything and everything I've ever done, I was like, if I'm going to do anything, just that, that's what I, if, if I learned two things from my mom, it's her work ethic mm-hmm. and to love people relentlessly and whatever I'm doing, I'm all in. So unfortunately for porn, like that's how it was. I was, I was all in, you know, I, I did a thousand movies in five years, you know, you can do the math and that's a lot of days on, not, not, not a lot of days off, but now 
in, in, in a positive sign, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to coach CrossFit. And then I worked my way up. So I was working like part-time slash full-time. Then another CrossFit gym showed interest in me being a, a, a full-time head coach. And that was something that now it's pretty common. Like now, now the structure of CrossFit is very different, but you know, five, five, six, five, four or five years ago, a full-time head coach, not common at all, but I had that opportunity and then continue working my way up, continue work, working my way up and uh, got, got a job as essentially a general manager at a CrossFit gym and then opened my own, my wife and I opened our own and, uh, and it's really nice. Yeah, you guys have you have a good thing going there. There's a okay. lot of excitement and positivity, and just yeah. like and and you bring that to the the energy in the room. The people yeah. seem to really just love you. you yeah, know, and that's a great. I bet place you have some be. really cool stories of transformation in people's life. What oh. CrossFit has meant to them, and oh, absolutely. And 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 what the the cool thing that I like to see is God using that to understand other things in my life, like what, what I'm good at, my ability to communicate, my ability to uh, feel emotion and respond to people in a different ways. But yeah, like you'll, you'll see someone and they'll come to you and it's like, I'm overweight. I want to get in shape or I'm overweight. I want to lose the weight. But you know, if, if you are a 35 year old man and you weigh 300 pounds, why are you looking right at me? Jack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am like, 37. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I was going to say though, like, if, but if, 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 if that's you, uh, you didn't get there by coincidence and you've built habits that's caused that. And yeah. the only way to get out of that is change a habit. So it's not going to be a diet. Uh, I'm very against diets. Um, you know, diets generally have a start and a finish. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, what are you going to do? You know, if, if you haven't changed anything about your lifestyle, yeah. you're just going to go back to doing what was comfortable because that's who we are as human beings. We are, we love normality. We love habitual things. We yeah. love, you know, doing the same routine for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. So if we don't change our lifestyle, we're going to go back to where we were. So you'll see these people, they are now in an environment with people who hold them accountable and, and they don't necessarily call them and check on them every day. Right. But, Hey, if I'm expecting to see you in the morning and we're now friends, then you've, there's just this natural instinct where it's yeah. like, okay. It well, also helps yeah. you on the commitment side. Like, you know, oh, yeah. that if you don't go, somebody is going to miss right. you or you're going to have to tell them why you didn't go. Right. And most people, like I know I would be, it wouldn't be okay with, but I was tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just it wouldn't yeah. be an excuse that yeah, it would be yeah, comfortable because, giving. <laughs> but I mean that, and, and that's how you, you start to change your habits. You know, it's just like just holding yourself accountable. Yeah. Like the, if I'm working with someone as far as like on a diet, it's like, okay, what, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to eat this or eat that? I'm like, no, I want you to write down everything you put in your mouth Monday through Wednesday. And look at it. You just look at yeah. it. Okay. Well, because, yeah. <laughs> but it's post true. It, post a picture. But of it's it. like, if, if you're going to eat that Snickers, but you're committed to writing everything you down, there's no caveats. There's no cop outs. It's yeah. like, if I'm going to eat it, I'm going to write it down. If you commit to that. I'm probably going to be less likely to, to yeah. do the thing that, you know, but just, just, I mean, it, just I know thinking I experience about that. Cause I'm real fits and starts with working out. Like either I'm working out or I'm not working. Right. Out. But when I am working out, I have a really hard time eating bad food. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I'm yeah. going through all the effort. Yeah. Here but on also the like workout side. And, it, and, and you don't under like, like most people who are out of shape or they don't eat well, or they don't exercise, they don't, uh, they don't understand their level of wellness or they don't understand their level of sickness. Like, yeah. I don't understand that I'm sick. If I don't work out and I eat poorly, you don't, because you acclimate to feeling that way. Right. This is just, you know, it's, it's the, this is just how I am. I, right. I think that's like the, the biggest excuse that anyone never had. This is just how I am. Yeah. The I, scientific I, word for that's homeostasis, right? right. The body yeah. just kind of gets comfortable with where it's at. And we're like, well, this is what we are now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're this. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just this way. <laughs> I'm just this yeah. way. And yeah. there's, there's like science that backs it up. I remember I read this book and I like to read books on all kinds of topics, but this book was really fascinating for me. It was called the obesity code by Dr. Funk. Mm. And, um, I think that's his real Dr. Name. Funk, Dr. Funk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the one. He also has a very popular career writing songs in the genre of funk. No, that's not true. But, um, he was talking about what you were saying, like why diets fail. Like right. diets are successful at most for like 18 months. Yeah. And the, the idea is, is that your body will get used to it. And then that's yeah. who you are now. So yeah. if you do the calorie cutting thing and you make, 
make it on 1200 calories a day. Right. And that's your body will get used to that. Mm. And then you'll stop losing weight in like 12, 18 months. And then what happens is that there's a cycle that kicks in. People are like, well, why the heck am I working so hard to diet if I'm not losing weight anymore? Right. So they give up on the diet, they gain it all back. Right. And then they find a new diet and yeah. they all work. He said in the book, like right. put the name on the diet. They're all going to work mm-hmm. to a point. Yeah. And then 12 to 18 months, which is now people's thinking, right? They're thinking yeah. I got to look better for vacation coming right. in three months. Um, it was really kind of an interesting book. If you're into that kind of stuff, it was a little dry, but at the same yeah. time, it was really interesting. Uh, yeah. Dr. Like, Funk. Yeah. Like someone, someone asked me, uh, I feel like today they were like, Hey, if I wanted to look better in five days, what could I do? I'm like <laughs> go back in time. You know? go, to, Photoshop. go to bed. <laughs> yeah. You need go to take to a picture and yeah. get good at Photoshop. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> but really like when it comes to aesthetics though, like, you know, people will say, Hey, th- um, this is my goal. And if, if your goal is aesthetics, the, the answer is food. It's not exercise. Yeah. Like you can work out all you want. Like I want to get abs. Okay, great. Uh, are your guts falling out of your body? No. Okay. Okay. You have, you have abs, you have a core, you know, those are protecting your internal organs. Everyone has that. Yes. Uh, I knew it. I I've been telling abs. my wife for years. <laughs> I, I want, have abs. I want abs. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're hidden. They're yeah. just insulated right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> I protect them. I protect I care them. about them so much. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's true. What's, what are you thinking is the, is the next chapter for you and your wife, Josh? Well, I think we're going to take over the world. Yeah. (laughs) Pinky in the brain. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So my wife and I, we we feel called into ministry and we'd been trying to figure that out the last four years. So what really set me back was trying to think I knew what it looked like. (laughs) It's like, it should look like this. And, and uh, God worked on me a little bit. Yeah. My, My wife teaches ESL, but she's going to be finished teaching at the the end of June. And then she's going to do like on, uh, like uh, at home, but it's kind of the same thing. Like there's, is your ear. Yeah. My wife does that. Yeah. VIP kids. VIP kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's pretty if cool. If you're looking for a job that you can do at home. Yeah. That's like a real one. Cause I know there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's yeah. uh, like work from home. And it's like, what are you going to do? And yeah. then there's a lot of those seemingly are paper scams. footballs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like envelopes for an organization. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So she, my wife teaches this in this thing called VIP kids. And uh, essentially she'll, you know, at night or in the morning, cause she's teaching Chinese children. And so it's the time zone, other side of the world, right? So at at weird times, she's up. And so we'll wake up in the house and be like, hello. And she's teaching English as a second language to to little kids. And she she gets the same kids every once in a while. And they get to name themselves, which is cute. Like, I'll be like, hey, Bruce Lee, how are you doing today? Because they don't use the real name either because they're being kind to the English teachers or parents want to protect their identity. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. So, yeah, so th- that that's our plan. So, I am currently applying at you know different churches, and yeah. I, I know what I'm qualified to do, but God knows that a little better than I do. So, would that replace the CrossFit endeavor, or as a yeah. business? Really, mm. you'd give that CrossFit in gym a se- up in a second? Yeah. What if that's your calling? <laughs> then so be it. Right. <laughs> but you're open. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's really important for for some people, and that's what I that's what God had taught me that to be, you know, to be a good steward of what you have first. It's just wild to see where, where my life has, has gone and what was important to me 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, what what was important to me and just becoming, you know, God being the most important thing in my life. Yeah. And it would be, and, and that was, that was tough. Like, uh, really understanding that and the more, the more I ruined my relationship with God, the more I understood, like I can be a better husband if I understand that God has to be the most important thing in my life. Yeah. And I can't be a good father unless I'm being a better husband and I'm being the best follower of Christ. Yeah. And if it's like out of that order, everything's out of whack. And until you have things in whack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the name of your book right there. Getting yeah. stuff in whack. Nice. The, uh, so whack a tree. <laughs> I think that's one of the, and I think I, I talked about this a little bit last time we had coffee. Like, um, I wish I spent 20 plus years working in churches and I wish for you, Josh, that I, that it was different than I think it's going to be for you. Cause right. Christians are, um, people that have had their, had their life changed, uh, call themselves Christians, they're not always the most loving crowd. Right. And, um, 
you know, we hear your story and I know I hear about people not being very forgiving or changing their opinions of you based on what they found out that you used to do, which I believe is very hypocritical because yeah. we have all done stuff. You know, regardless of, of how it works out, I think that God has equipped me with a radical story that's not about me. It's about him. Yeah. And I have had several opportunities to do like a short film or a documentary or this and that. And they're like, you know, your story is incredible. Uh, I can't wait to shoot this with you. This is going to be awesome. Um, but we have a very diverse audience. So if you could just love, just leave the Jesus part out, it would be amazing. I'm like, but that's the story. Mm. That's the story. And that's something that. That's the thing that stuck for you. Like right. it was the thing that was the catalyst for yeah. change. And, yeah. And and I think it's important that, you know, that that's why I started the podcast. That's why I'm, I'm writing a book. That's why I want to spend my life really explaining it and telling people about how I, I couldn't do it. And, and not only could I do it, I wasn't even looking for it. God chased me down when I was, a, I, in my mind, I was a million miles away from him. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't an instantaneous thing. Like I didn't become this, like yeah. you know, this guy who like nerds out on the Bible, yeah. you know, I, but it was a, it was a process, but it was a process, but I had to remove bad habits and bad things that I've experienced and replace them with new ones. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like I really have to say to, to people, but you know, men specifically, that's something I feel called to like equipping men to understand like the, 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 the rift that it causes like in your life, like sexual immorality or, or how we look at women or pornography specifically, like what that does to you and, and what it is. And I think that through my experience, God bringing me out on the other side equips me in a way that some people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be equipped. Yeah. You're going to have a huge platform, man. I mean, talking to people in front of people, I think, yeah. you know, like Ted talk kind of level stuff. Yeah. I think you're on the way somewhere. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the book you're working on. The book. Yeah. The tell book. us about that. The book. <laughs> the das book. It's called the book. The book. The, the good book. book. Yeah. So ultimately I, I just wanted to tell my story, start, start to finish, but tell it in a way where just it's just real it's it's this is what really happened um but also understanding that it was it was a it was a process like yeah. you know i think uh the the best comparison that i could think of is the difference between a wound and a scar so like a wound is still open and it could get, it could it could affect my it could get infected it can affect you yeah but a scar has been healed but you you can know you know where i where i've been mm-hmm so I, I can, I can show that, Hey, uh, yeah, I did do this, but now I'm on the other side of it and I can speak wisdom into it because I'm healed from it. So how do you handle the, the stigma nowadays now that you've, it's been, it's a scar. Right. And how do you deal with, like you said, you still get regular feedback from people, people just spamming like, yeah. So it's almost like they want to be like, Hey, did you know this guy did porn? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's not even kind of like that. It's literally, <laughs> it's that. literally like that. So like, don't do anything good. This guy like, can't do anything good. Like three years ago, someone like posted on my, like on my gym, like Facebook page. Like, did you know that your coach and owner was a pornographer? They're like we, we know him. Yeah, we know. Yeah. 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 Thanks. I think that's kind of a, yeah. what you're saying about just <laughs> leaning into it. There's got to be a scary way to live. Oh, but it, it is. But, but at the same time, it's a it, takes, it, it, it takes out the, like, yeah, what are you going to throw? I know. I, right. Yeah. It's like, like with my wife, like you're not going to tell my wife something that's going to surprise her. Yeah. You know? Um, so my response generally is, you know, it, is there something going on in your life that you want to talk about? Because obviously you messaging me this and you don't know anything about me has nothing to do with you messaging me that. So if you want to have an actual conversation, I'm open to it. Yeah. Mm. And then generally they either respond and then we have a great conversation or they don't say anything else. Yeah. And it, it's never like continue like antagonizing me because there's, there's nowhere to go from that. Yeah. Well, Josh was saying, he, and I agree, I think you will have a, a really good platform. And I think your story is bigger than just pornography from my perspective. I think what you were dealing with was something that a lot of people deal with that's bigger than pornography, which is hopelessness. Right. Like what, what happens in your life when hope gets taken away? Yeah. 
and you lose. And I think what you talked about describes what happens in people's lives when we isolate ourselves. Right. We start to pull back from our friends and family. Yeah. We start to um, look at ourselves through the lens of an identity that we've created that's not even a real identity anymore. Right. Like we're this new person and this is who we are now. Right. And, um, and it's really, it's very poignant, I think, in your story that your wife's name is Hope. Right. And um, and you attended a church called Hope. Yeah. It's like this idea was just like hunting you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I will find you. <laughs> yeah. It's like the hound of heaven. Uh, yeah. Liam Neeson. Uh, yeah. Neeson. It's Liam. Liam. Yeah. He's, he's in I his will new find movie. You. Yeah. <laughs> I fucked searchlight pictures. Liam yeah. Neeson plays Hope. <laughs> I, I have a very specific <laughs> thing. <laughs> broom. I'm calling you Broom <laughs> over here, Broom. <laughs> Well, that's awesome, man. So you're, you're working on your book. I would like to be done with the book by September. Are you shopping for publishers? I'm not. Are you going to self-publish? I think so. Um, yeah. And, and I, I did do a little research as far as like paying for publishing. And I was like, that is yeah. insanely expensive. But yeah, I, I, I think I would probably self-publish. Because what, what I would want to do is go through a publisher and skew the story. Yeah. Because that... If you're a publisher, who wouldn't do that to Josh? No skewing around. No skewing around. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you handle, how do you handle the question that I imagine you get that's coming from a place of skepticism? Like, all right, let's take Jesus out of your story, Josh. And some guy at a bank said your name and you got scared and went home. Right. And so how do you handle like a cynic that just doesn't want to buy any of the stuff that you're selling with this Jesus stuff? Right. That's a great question though. That's a great question. I mean, you, you, you just have to, you know, take a look at, you know, the, the totality of, of my life and what it looks like right now. Yeah. Mm. I think that, uh, you can debate theology, you can debate the resurrection, you can debate a lot of things, but it's, it's harder to debate a transformed life. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, oh, I'm trying to remember the Chinese proverb that basically says the same approach. It's a, a man Yes, I remember it now. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Hmm. What would you say to somebody? I think you're in a unique position who is currently in a position of feeling hopeless. Right. Uh, like they don't see the way out. I will tell myself that I'm not good enough. I'll tell myself a lie mm-hmm. and then I'll believe that lie. And now I'll live like that lie is truth. It's, a, it's an identity crisis like you were talking about. So I, I have to remove the lies that I've told myself. Mm-hmm. You know, why did, why did I get here? How did I get here? And And I think that's why that's so difficult because that's, that's a level of honesty that we don't, when we've screwed up, like when we know that we've screwed up, like you were joking before, like, Oh really? I'm not supposed to do this. We all feel that way about stuff in our lives, habits we've allowed to develop. Like it doesn't take a lot of convincing to be like, Oh, that's wrong. I know. Yeah. And we often don't handle it very well. Yeah. Um, If you are in seclusion, it's unhealthy. Yeah. Like the second, probably most important thing about yourself is who you believe yourself to be. And I would say the first important thing that you you would believe about anything is who you believe God to be. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's awesome, man. I really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah it's been great. It's good. If you ever need us to be on your uh, other podcast, you just let us know. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Good stuff. Thanks Thank so you guys. much, Josh. Yeah, we love you, man. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate yeah. it. Yep. You're listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Something he said that impacted me was about how a transformed life. You can't argue with that. Yeah. Like, you know, you sit in front of a guy who's been into that area and on a big way. And now he's like, obviously fired up about a different lifestyle and dealing with that. I can only imagine being, um, being him and having been down that road and having things that are out there that can't be taken away and like that struggle. And he's, he's raising a son, you know, uh, he's got a little one and his wife is totally, they're totally in love. And it's just like, it's a good, a good inspiring story. And he's being approached, this being approached by with large sums of money to make his story. But then they'd say, Oh, just tweak this and then take out the Jesus thing and all this. That's just, it, it's a, it's a, it's an it's an inspiring story man yeah 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 i think so too and i think that he is uh i wish him all the the success in the world and uh, i think he's going to be real successful in what he's doing i look forward to to his book and yeah. on that coming out yeah and um his podcast and all that
Yeah. I love loving people like loving my brother, Josh and whoever it is, you know, it's just yeah. like, we're sitting here with people that are bearing their soul. And yeah, those people that have been forgiven a lot, love a lot. Mm, yes. And I think that that's one of the things that I think is going to be a key to success for Josh mm -hmm. is there's, it's really hard in spending a little bit of time with him to not catch the genuineness of mm -hmm. his, uh, new life. Yeah. Yeah. Josh Broom sweeping away the naysayers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. Sweeping away. <laughs> that's right, man. Own it, brother. So um, check out his podcast. Check him out. Cross Pod Promotion. Right here. We love making this stuff for you. You can help us out by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Get unstuck. Tell a better story. And have a good answer to the question. What are you doing today?